I think the more individuals we get committing to an oath of integrity, competing with honour, speaking up when things are wrong, then I think the, the, the strength of the industry and its, and its spine will, will can only get stronger and hopefully the trust factor in, in the industry will also rise. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. Welcome to Ethics in Business in Their Own Words. ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, has teamed up with Carnegie Council and CFA Institute to produce this interview series launched in 2018 for Global Ethics Day. The series features global business leaders exploring how businesses are preparing for an ethical future in the face of challenges presented by globalization, technology, and human psychology. Today, we're talking to Emilio Gonzalez, Group CEO and Managing Director of Pendle Group. Headquartered in Sydney, Australia, Pendle is an independent global investment management business focused on delivering superior investment returns for clients through active management. Pendle was originally established in 1969 under the name BT Australia Limited and became one of the most successful funds management businesses in Australia. It rebranded to Pendle in 2018 and has expanded globally through its wholly owned subsidiary J.O. Hambro Capital Management and offices in London, Singapore, New York and Boston. Tell me, what role does your company play in the community? We like to participate as often as we can and we play a number of roles. I'm really pleased to say that the staff is very engaged in raising money, fundraising uh, around the world, whether it be a London office, a US office or a Sydney office. We have uh, community committees that run functions and we raise funds for cancer, cystic fibrosis. One charity we're very proud to be part of is a charity that's close to our heart which is Running for Premature Babies. We had a previous staff member who unfortunately passed away, um, but he had twins at, at a, when, he was, when he was becoming a dad for the first time. And he was very lucky that, that the hospital he was at had the right equipment. But we discovered that not every hospital had that equipment. And so the business over the last few years has been raising money to ensure that every hospital has the right equipment when premature babies are born. In addition to that, we help and people who aren't as privileged as ourselves in the industry. In our London office, we invite children from schools in a less well um, economic area and allow them to come in and we share with them what we do, what a typical day in the office is and encourage them in terms of getting into investment management as well. How does your company work to create a diversity in the industry it serves? Very good question. Uh, unfortunately, our industry has a very poor record of diversity, particularly at the front line. Not so much in the back office or client service or marketing, but in the front line where there's the day-to-day -day management of our clients' funds, very dominated by, by male and not a lot of female participation. One of the activities and initiatives that we have introduced recently is an internship program particularly targeted at females in their last year at university. And so we've gone out and started a program to bring in females to work with our investment teams to get them to better understand uh, what we do, how it's done, and give them a introduction and a leg up into the world of funds management. Out of that program, we've actually been able to hire females into our investment teams, and that's, that's one way of doing it. There's a number of other activities and work that we do. We've been a founding member of a program run by Mercers around Future Impact, which they've put in place to try and educate the workforce on the female side about how to get into the industry, what's required, and what's the process to um, ensuring that there's a, there's a career there for females and males. And so we've been part of that important initiative. And also, we're also part of um, Women in Finance, there are a number of initiatives and membership that we participate to try and increase the diversity of participation in what we do. In, in the context of Australia, because this is where we are, how does your company work to support minorities who are already in the workplace? So you were talking about the presence in the back office um, and in other sectors. How do you bring them to the front? 
Well, on the diversity front between male and female, there's a number of programs, as I mentioned, around internship programs, but also in terms of supporting the staff, generally, we do have a very flexible working environment. We do allow staff to work part-time if it works for them and, and it works for us. We allow them to um, adjust their hours. We, I think we have very generous maternity leave and paternity leave. And so all of that, we, we certainly have policies in place. One thing we did introduce some time ago now is what we call contribution leave. And that is additional leave on top of your annual leave that you can use for anything beyond um, what you would normally use for annual leave. So there was a period there where we were getting requests from uh, people who had religious holidays when it wasn't a public holiday uh, and other reasons to take time off or the day off for personal reasons. And we felt that that wouldn't be part of your annual leave. We'll preserve that and allow them to take up to five days in additional contribution leave for areas that they choose. And that may well be for, for religious reasons or, or other reasons. So that's separate from everything else. So that's an additional perk of being part of this organization. Yes, and so what we found with contribution leave is that people were asking requests for either uh, religious re reasons or for personal reasons, and we didn't want to differentiate one group versus another group. So we said, in addition to your annual leave, um, you can have contribution leave, and you, you can decide what you use that for. One other reason we did that is we had staff that were volunteering in terms of uh, state emergency service. So we've got a lot of volunteers that do work for a lot of charities. And who do you choose whether they have a day off or not? And so, again, contribution leave um, is there to assist them to be able to use it and not eat, in, eat into their annual leave. It plays a role. So now we're, I want to shift a little bit to um, technology and it, advancements. How did your company help management employees and providers um, adapt to technological change? Very good question. We're in the process at the moment of thinking about how technology impacts what we do. And I think asset management is very poor at it, mainly because what we saw is investment performance. People don't come to us because of our great technology, although I think that is changing in terms of our ability to service our clients and deliver information in a much more effective way using technology. So one of the things that we are thinking about is how do we better improve our experience with clients and use technology in our processes, and that's also a change in mindset. And there's a couple of things we've, we've identified to help people on that journey. A lot of it's got to do with education. And we've brought in leaders in the industry in firms that technology is the core foundation of what they do and they're, and they're at the edge of it. So we've had people from Facebook, we've had people from Google come in and talk to us about their work environment and how they use technology. For them, that's not a threat, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so getting people educated in terms of how to use it in a way that's your friend as opposed to your foe is an important part of that journey. We also um, tap into external people in the fintech world to come in and talk to us about what's happening out there in terms of the way the market's changing, in terms of the way businesses are changing and how technology is changing. So there's an education process um, which we run and it's a process that we know we've got a long journey ahead of us to adapt to a world of new technology and how to use that. And to a large extent, it is scary. because We don't know what we're heading into, but we need to bring our people along that journey as well. The main um, uh, ingredient of advanced technology these days anyway is AI. That's what everyone talks about. And many people feel threatened by it and others embrace it. How, how is AI um, embraced or accepted at Pendle? Look, I think it's early days yet. And one of the areas that AI, was well, probably two areas AI can be used in an efficient way is better um, use of looking at data and analysing that data very, very quickly that the human capabilities is unable to do so and come up with responses around that. And also, how can AI help you uh, be more efficient in processes that you do very manually on an ongoing basis? I think there's still a long way to go in terms of our understanding of it. And it's fair to say that asset managers and fund managers are quite cynical or wary about the latest trend and the latest thing. And so we've been through many cycles. Um, I remember the internet boom where there was a lot of new technology that was going to solve a lot of, a lot of problems for a lot of people. 
And so I think our adaption of AI will happen gradually, uh, but we need to be convinced that it adds value to what we do. But I also see its application in a lot of the processes we do on, on a manual basis that is quite repetitive, that can, we, can, we can certainly do a better job. And how do you, you, man, you talked about the cynicism, how do you manage that? Well, I think it's healthy. I think for those of us who are in investment management, cynicism is an important ingredient of a good money manager. And you learn that through experience. You learn to question and challenge and have an open mind and try and do away with biases. And part of that technique is questioning the obvious, questioning the theory, questioning the statement, looking for different angles. And so I think healthy cynicism is an important ingredient of ensuring that we're making the right decisions for our clients. So uh, again, in the same neighborhood of what we're talking about, how, how is your company helping with retraining all of your employees who need to adjust to an increasingly automated world? It comes back to, I think, understanding the journey we're going on. And it's no different to the development of the internet or the development of any technology that will change the way businesses will work. You need to embrace it and you need to understand, well, what's my role in that? And one of the things we need to do is, if there is an opportunity for people's jobs to change, how can we train them up into a new process or a new world where technology becomes a, an, in, an increasing part of what they do? And so whether it be AI, whether it be new pieces, it's not new. Um, this is the way business have evolved for many, many years. Uh, the new technology come. Remember the days, I remember pre-Excel days. Uh, pre-Lotus 1, 2, 3. Everything was done manually. And then this new technology piece comes through and all of a sudden, all these people that are great at manual maths are not as valuable because you can do it on a spreadsheet. And so what you need to do there is educate them in terms of rebuilding their skill set and using what they do to a whole new skill set. So it's important to embrace it and educate and train people up as the world embraces different ways of doing things. What is the greatest ethical challenge facing your company and your, your industry in general? I think trust. I don't think that will come as a surprise. We're in a business where we manage other people's money and the number one thing you need to have is trust. That's been challenged, particularly coming out of the financial crisis 10, 12 years ago and in the Australian market even more so now given the recent Royal Commission out of the banking and finance. And so the big challenge we as an industry as a whole is ensuring that we can gain the trust of our clients, the trust of our customers. We're entrusted with managing their wealth, managing their money, and it's not always apparent that that trust is there. And so we need to put programs in place or act in a way that we put our clients first and that will take time. And over, over, over time, hopefully, we can be seen as a, as a profession that can be trusted, not only as a business that is focused on making money for shareholders. And how do you um, enforce that trust? Is it, is it as simple as <laughs> taking your clients out to lunch once a month? I mean, sorry to sound so simple. Um, how do you do that? How do you build the trust? It comes down to the culture, and it comes down from the leadership. And so trust is, you see it every day in what you do. It's not a bunch of words or uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, the lead, it has to start from the very, very top. And the meetings that you, that you attend, the decisions that you make, the words that you use, uh, you need to demonstrate integrity, transparency, honesty, and be upfront with your clients. So every piece of communication, every piece of activity, Every piece of work that you do comes back down to are we ensuring that the decisions we're making and the direction the business is taking is putting our clients first? And secondly, is it enforcing our confidence in the trust that people have in us to manage their money? So you're on the board of, um, of the BFO. Explain a little bit the role. Tell us about the BFO. The Banking and Finance Oath was a child that was developed out of the 2008-2009 financial crisis and it was put together by industry leaders who felt that trust needed to be recreated in the industry and at the forefront of that was individuals making an oath in terms of their, their commitment 
to behave in an, in a, in an honourable way, integrity, um, compete with, with, with honour, and also uh, support individuals who maybe um, see things that are correct in organisations and speak up around that. In 2008, I was investment management and it was a tough period and I could see that markets were very much in free fall and things were starting to come out in terms of uh, companies and financial institutions that could have done a better job in terms of managing people's money. So the banking and finance oath, I think, goes a long way to creating individual responsibility. There's a lot of codes of conduct, there's a lot of industry codes, there's a lot of company codes. But to a large extent, they're ones you have to take to participate in the industry. The difference with the banking and finance oath, it's just a commitment to yourself. And you can regulate markets as much as you want, you can put industry codes as much as you want, but at the end of the day, it's the individual behaviour and activities that people take at the front line that matters the most. We've had over 3,000 signatures, and more recently, we've started a campaign that the more who sign, the greater the spine and the stronger the spine. And so I think if more and more individuals make a commitment to themselves about competing with honour, as well as speaking up when things are wrong, then the industry as a whole will be strengthened by that, and hence that strength of spine there. So even with the banking and finance oath, with its limited resources and early uh, stage of its, of its life, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by the uptake and the encouragement that people are willing to sign up in a voluntary manner to hold up a certain standard. So the more you sign, the stronger the spine. That's correct, yes. That's a great, that's a great uh, saying. Yeah, well, it's true as well. And I think the more individuals we get committing to an oath of integrity, and com competing with honour, speaking up when things are wrong, then I think the, the, the strength of the industry and its, and its spine can only get stronger and hopefully the trust factor in, in the industry will also rise.